Hi, I'm Kelly Thomas. Welcome to Ingenious Baby. Every week I'll interview leading experts to help you help your child reach their full potential so that your child can become all that they were born to be. Could your picky eater have bigger issues? Today we're here with Dr. Robert Melillo, a university professor, brain researcher, best-selling author, and co-founder of Brain Balance Achievement Centers. He'll tell us the signs your child could have a brain imbalance and share his groundbreaking secrets on how to restore this balance and raise a smarter kid. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Melillo. I'm so honored to have you on the show. Dr. Melillo is a pioneer in neurological development and um, will help tell us how the right and left side of the brain develops properly in children. How did you get interested in the brain? Well, you know, I'm a clinician and, and uh, my, my interest has always been and started out in neurology and rehabilitation and started out working with adults. There was a lot of cool brain science coming out in the early 90s when I was really developing a lot of this. And um, the 90s was a decade of the brain and we could see new ways of imaging the brain in real time. Things like PET scans and SPEC scans and fMRI were just coming out. So all of this explosion of brain research came out about the dynamics of the brain and the way the brain works and the way it develops and and really what what is at the core of a lot of these issues and it was uh, realized that even most adult problems are actually developmental that there's something that goes awry in the development of the brain why is it important that the brain's balanced because i mean some of the greatest minds in history you know einstein even maybe some silicon valley ceo the musk maybe have an imbalance and isn't that the thing that makes them great? I mean, if you balance the brain, would they lose some of that, if you will, the eccentricity or genius? Right. You know, if you look at genius, the way I look at it, there's, there's kind of two types of genius. One type of genius is, is where we have areas of the brain that are incredibly strong. We have networks in the brain that are really very coherent, and this is what we see mm -hmm. in many people. But that may be associated with a disability or a deficiency on the other side. So, for instance, you have somebody like Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. who was obviously a brilliant genius, but also struggled his whole life with OCD, never had one personal relationship that anybody ever made aware of. And, and he really, um, you know, was considered kind of a very odd, unfriendly guy, and people didn't like him. Now, if we had balanced his right brain out, he would have been the same genius, but he would have had a better social life and people would have liked him better and he might have actually been a happier person. The ultimate genius is then when we have perfect balance and integration of the whole brain so we can bring the whole brain together simultaneously and use all those areas of the brain. And that actually gives us, I think, the ultimate genius. And I think someone like Leonardo da Vinci was, was probably the closest that. Yeah. to that. He was Historic. a fantastic artist. You know, but he also was, um, you know, incredibly good with with details and uh, inventions. And so what we see is that Leonardo used to spend his whole life training himself to use both hands equally. So I think he kind of instinctively knew that, you know, a balanced brain was the key to true genius. So that's the thing is that what we see in most of the kids that we work with, I say that the reason why we end, they end up with us is because they are actually gifted kids. They have areas of their brain that are naturally stronger. They have stronger connections than most people their age. But what happens is that if the other side of the brain doesn't keep up with that in development, mm -hmm. it's more likely to result in an imbalance. And a little bit of an imbalance is okay, but too much of an imbalance just actually makes the two sides of the brain incompatible. They can't share and integrate information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've always heard there's a thin line between genius and insanity. And I think that that, that line is a little bit of an imbalance or too much of an imbalance. And I think that is actually the key. Interesting. So when we talk about, you know, children who are, you know, just developing the, the real early years, can you tell if there's an imbalance really early on, like before, maybe four years old? Yeah, the fact is you can tell from an imbalance almost from the moment they're born. 
many kids we know, they're born where their immune system is already dysfunctional. Many kids with autism, they already seem to have an overactive immune system. They have eczema or, you know, sensitivities. Mm -hmm. What we also know is that many kids are born with low muscle tone and have difficulty latching on and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Uh, But certainly you can start to see it with their developmental milestones that if a child doesn't roll over at three to five months, or if they roll over to one side and not the other, if they don't crawl properly, if they don't walk on time. Mm -hmm. These milestones are incredibly important and much narrower than people think. So Mm -hmm. what we see is that, um, you know, a guy named Ami Klim using uh, eye tracking technology showed that you could identify kids with autism to be at two months of age by the difference in the eye contact and whether they focus on the mother's eyes or whether they look at her mouth, or whether they don't look at the mother's face at all. So you can see very early on, and you can start to intervene very early on. There's a number of studies that have shown looking at identical twins, and this was both with autism and with schizophrenia. And they showed that when they looked at identical twins and they followed them out, and when they developed later on autism or even schizophrenia in their 20s, when they went back and looked at their baby videos, they could see at six months of age, that even untrained people could identify that the one that ended up with schizophrenia or the one that ended up with autism was already moving differently and was much more clumsy and awkward. And this has a lot to do with what we call primitive reflexes and motor development. That's really interesting. So, you know, looking back at, I have two children aged two and three, and, you know, my son has some of the right brain weaknesses that you mentioned in your book. And he also, you know, was late and rolling over and crawling and, you know, has asthma and, and eczema. If they have these issues, is it something that, you know, to help balance it that early on? Or does it sometimes grow out of these things or, you know, turn into other things? More often than not, if there is an imbalance, um, it usually gets worse over time. It doesn't get better. Sometimes mm-hmm. some more obvious things may go away or may seem to go away. Mm-hmm. So like a child may start out with certain food, obvious food sensitivities, and then um, they may appear to go away because they don't have any real outward signs. Mm-hmm. But if we actually test them and look at their immune reaction, they still react to it. So kids may look like they have dairy sensitivity and then they go off dairy and, and, then, and then they can go back, they go back and they don't seem to have the same level. But the fact is if we test them and do blood tests, we can still that the sensitivity is still there and it only affects their behavior. It doesn't affect any physical symptoms. So it really comes down to if there is you know, some sort of developmental milestone imbalance or an imbalance that's that's early on, chances Mm -hmm. are that imbalance tends to build over time. Uh, But you're obviously more than the the typical knowledge mom and and you've probably done a lot of great things. And so it is possible. But the idea is at least you're alert, you're looking for things and you're paying attention so that if you have any questions, you can, you know, do something and intervene quickly. Is it more common to have a right brain uh, weakness or a left brain weakness? You know, it's a good question. And I have to say, I think it's pretty even, to be honest with you. Um, When we look at things like learning disabilities, they're probably the single number one problem, including dyslexia, which is clearly a left brain weakness. Uh And that affects around 15 to 20 percent of the population. But on the other hand, if we look at ADHD, uh, OCD, Tourette's and autistic type behaviors, you know, which are clearly right brain delays, um, they, you know, ADHD alone makes up about 11% of the population of childhood and adolescence. And then if you add the other ones, it's probably close to 15% um, percent as well. Overall, we're looking at about one in five, maybe even one in four kids in the United States have some type of developmental issue. And many experts believe that that's actually underreported. So it's probably even more than that. But it's it's probably an even distribution. And even in our centers, um, you know, we see an even distribution. The only thing is that right brain issues tend to be more behavioral. They tend to affect more emotions. They tend to affect attention and behavior and outbursts mm-hmm. and uh, oppositional. So they tend to be more noticed earlier and they tend to be more, they have more of a disruptive effect on the family. So families are more likely to act quicker mm-hmm. on a right brain delay than they will if a child just has a learning disability that they may not pick up until fourth grade.
you had mentioned like it's really, um, it's, it's not good if they miss a milestone, but sometimes I think milestones can be missed because parents are maybe you know, propping their baby up too early or getting them to walk. Does that also impact the imbalance or is it just, a, are you talking about more the natural development if they aren't doing it on their own? Because I feel like these days more and more people are like, you know, let's walk before they're yeah. ready. I think that it's partly natural, but I think it can be interfered with by parents. I think you're right that, you know, the brain develops in layers, right? So what we know is that it, it develops in series, not in parallel, meaning the right brain forms in the womb and for the first two to three years, and then the left brain, and then the right brain, and then the left brain. And each time the brain gets a little bit different on each side, and they become, you know, developed. And that is partly the uniqueness of the human brain. So it needs to develop in stages. And all of those stages in development are designed to help build that layer of the brain appropriately. Mm -hmm. So if we skip it or if we miss it, then it really does matter because it affects the foundation of the brain. The, 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 I just did a uh, lecture at Oxford University and the whole basis of the conference was movement and cognition. Mm -hmm. And that in the psychiatry, psychology and education world, we now recognize that really motor development is essential and foundational for all cognitive and emotional development. If you don't have normal motor development, you don't build the foundation. It's like not building a good foundation in a house and you, you continue to build the house. You know, the roof is always going to stay cracked because the foundation. And so if there is something and, and something that affects. So if the parents don't allow the children to crawl long enough or if they don't crawl or if they suddenly walk, mm -hmm. if they walk too early, you know, if they walk earlier than than 10 months or, you know, or even earlier than 11 months or if they work, walk later than 14 months in my assess uh, assessment, that's late. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is very important. And I think you're right, putting them in jumpers and bouncing and trying to get them to stand up too soon mm -hmm. and not giving, letting them just lay on the ground and do that thing, I think is very important. How does that impact it later on then if they're not building the connection? When does that show sure. up? What we see in the brain is when we actually do research and look at it and measure it, and um, we see that things like ADHD and learning disabilities what we see in the brain is areas of the brain that look immature, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of arrested in their development. They're not damaged, mm -hmm. they're not injured, there's no pathology per se, mm -hmm. but what we see is certain areas of the brain look more mature and more connected and literally have physically more and stronger connections while other areas of the brain are underdeveloped and immature. Um, so what we see is that if we don't go through those normal stages, Mm -hmm. It causes this kind of arrested development and leads to what we call a developmental asynchrony, where the different sides of the brain are developing at different rates. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it can show up again in the motor milestones, but then it can show up at any age in, in any system, right? So it may be that you just see immune changes because the brain controls the immune system, the brain controls the digestive system and the autonomic system and the heart rate and the mm -hmm. brain is what controls the detoxification. And so anything that's affecting the, the baby um, and that is unusual for where they're at, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's you know they have severe allergies or they're always getting sick Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's that they cry all the time or, mm -hmm. you know, or they don't have any eye contact. But you can see it early on and the earlier you see it, the better it is to intervene at that point. So what can you do? I'm just thinking again of my son who, you know, definitely has a lot of problems with his respiratory and being sick all the time. And definitely I, I call him my future CEO. Then you, you have exercises for right and left brain. Um, what are some tips that you could give to um, maybe exercise well, the weak side of the brain? One of the things I would say is that, you know, every child is different. So what mm -hmm. I would suggest is that in my book, Disconnected Kids mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Reconnected Kids, I have a, a bunch of different assessments that the parent can do. Mm -hmm. um, you, it sounds like you did it with your child, maybe, mm -hmm. in my book. And mm -hmm. from that, in all different areas, looking at, you know, not only hemispheric balance, but also looking at the development of different systems their motor systems, their sensory systems, their autonom autonomic and immune system, their cognitive. And so what I would suggest is a parent can look at that. But 
um, if we just give some general guidelines, you know, doing sensory stimulation from the opposite side of the body, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, using music or sound from, from the opposite ear or touching or massaging one side, you know, the left side of the body to stimulate the right brain, um, shining light in the left eye primarily, um, mm -hmm. spinning, you know, the, to get the inner ear spinning in, in one direction or the, uh, or the other can stimulate the opposite side of the brain, um, getting them to do different exercises, getting them to do other big muscle exercises is very important for the right brain. So core exercises, strengthening exercises, um, for their back, their core, their stomach, you know, actually building muscle tone and strength, which gives them a better awareness of their body. Body awareness and spatial awareness is generally a right brain type of thing. This also, looking at their facial asymmetry is important because if they seem to have a little asymmetry in their face, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this tells us that two, th two systems are interrelated and aren't really developing in a balanced way. One is the autonomic system, the vagus nerve mm -hmm. um, that regulates the heart and the digestive system really de is, is developing and, we, and that also increases muscle tone in the face. Hmm. Um, but what we also see is that that also leads to the ability to swallow and chew and vocalize. So it even leads to, you know, to uh, some feeding issues, swallowing, sensitivity, and even taste and also the ability to speak. Mm -hmm. But what it also is part of is what we call the social engagement system, the ability to read facial expression on other people and communicate non-verbally. And mm -hmm. right hemisphere is what com communicates non-verbally. So most mm -hmm. kids with right hemisphere delays, they end up with more social issues. They're mm -hmm. not reading social cues. The left brain generates anger, so they may have anger outbursts because the right brain isn't there to to correct it or stop it or inhibit it. Mm -hmm. And they have an overactive immune system. So everything you described mm -hmm. kind of fits a right brain delay. This can also lead to ticks. It can lead to stims. It can lead to obsessive compulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are an overactive left brain and a, an underactive right brain. So uh, activities that can stimulate that, uh, I list a whole bunch of them in my book, but even doing things like smell and music and light and sound and vestibular input and exercises, all of that is pretty specific for that area. That's interesting. And so we're talking about the right brain. I also read all these, you know, theories on um, how you, know, you, you really train your right brain. You can become photographic memory and a speed reading. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the right brain is more holistic, so mm -hmm. it's able to see things all at once, whereas the left brain reads, reads sequentially. So the left brain is really more about, you know, reading words and reading individual words and lines um, mm -hmm. and, you know, memorizing words and spelling and vocabulary and basic math operations and numbers. Um, but the ability to understand what the story is about, the main idea Mm -hmm. um, getting the overall, you know, pragmatics, uh, what's between the lines, the inferences, that's all what the right brain does with reading. Mm -hmm. So I think with some aspects of, uh, of memory, you know, we find that typically kids with right brain delays and left brain strength tend to have that eidetic memory, that memory like where they just can remember every fact and detail and figures and, you know, that calendar counting type of thing that you see in autistics or autistic savants. Whereas, you know, the right brain learns more by what we call um, implicit memory, is subconsciously. So we learn things with the right brain, but we don't really recall it consciously so much. The right brain is more about remembering experiences of a situation or what happened or the feelings or the emotions around certain, but it doesn't really have a timeline. The left brain remembers the timeline and all of the details. And normally both sides of the brain integrate perfectly to create, you know, a perfect memory. So one other question I had in terms of the, um, when you kind of intervene, if you will, and, and, and making a right brain, left brain weakness, you know, you can do that any time of your life, but is it easier to sort of retrain the brain when you're much younger versus when you're growing older? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and when we look at neuroplasticity, which is really the principle of changing the brain, right, which basically says that, you know, through training and stimulation and activation, 
um, we can change the brain physically and chemically. And and that is really the basis of learning, right? We, whenever we learn, we're changing the brain. We know that if you learn something new, if I taught you something here tonight uh, or today, what will happen is within one hour, we could measure changes in your gray matter. We could literally physically see changes in your brain. Um, and we know that neuroplasticity is a product of a couple of things. One is the younger we are, the more plastic our brain we, mm -hmm. is. But it's also a product of engagement and motivation. So the more engaged in the activity you are, the more motivated you are in the activity, the faster neuroplasticity will happen. So what we find is that, you know, in little, little babies and kids, obviously it's harder to get them engaged or motivated to do activities. And it can add to a lot of stress because they're going through, you know, different, um, like stranger anxiety. And so it's better to wait until they're a little older and they can actually enjoy coming to our centers and really engage in the process and really do a lot more strenuous, intense activities. Mm -hmm. And then we can make changes equally as quick. And I've seen teenagers or even older kids that are so motivated to become more social or have more friends mm -hmm. that we've seen huge, dramatic changes uh, because of their motivation level. So it's really a product of all of that. So that's true even at any age. So if at any age you're really motivated to learn something, you can learn it as fast as just about anybody um, right. if you really focus on it and you really do it intensely. If you had one thing you'd want a parent or, or family of a, of a young child to know about brain, developing brain, what would it be? Um, that movement is the key to brain development early on. That moving our body and interpersonal relationship are the two most important things to build intelligence. People think that in a, sitting in a computer, um, doing um, you know, sedentary activities where <clears throat> we're doing flashcards or you know, um, playing video games are actually gonna build intelligence. They don't, it's the exact opposite. Baby Einstein videos have been shown to make kids dumber. Um, oh, that really, yeah. mo movement and moving and engaging our senses, <clears throat> especially in the first six years of life when the foundation <clears throat> of the two sides of the brain is being formed, is so critical. And the biggest mistake right now is that it drives me crazy. Everywhere I go, I see babies, infants, one-year-old, two-year-olds, you know, with a phone or computer shoved in front of them. Oh, and yeah. the parents literally do it where, you know, the, I'll see them, the kid will be sitting there, they'll be perfectly happy, maybe daydreaming, and the parent will go, here, here's your phone, here's your phone, here's yeah. your phone. You know, it's like, what are you doing? Leave them alone, let them be bored, let them use their imagination. You know, we have our own entertainment system in our brain called an imagination that kicks in, but it only kicks in when we're bored, right? right. And it, it's just, it really, I, I think it's very, very upsetting. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, we, if parents, the one thing I think parents now are going to struggle with is the use of technology. And I think it's totally out of control. And I think most parents know that. And I yeah. think parents should go with their instincts more and really understand and not look around and see what other people are doing mm -hmm. and, you know, go to peer pressure. This is your child. This is your child's life. What happens in those first six years of life is going to affect them for the rest of their life. Um, and so, you know, that, as you said earlier, you know, from zero to three, the brain grows to 90% of the adult size. So, you know, especially in the first three years, keep kids away from technology completely because it will literally reshape their brain. It'll kick the left brain on too early, especially playing video games. Um, if they play video games too early, it engages the left brain and it will cause severe imbalances and can really even, even, it with with extensive use, you know, people are calling it digital heroin because yeah, it literally, it's really it's, a, it's an addiction. It literally changes the reward areas of the brain the way that heroin or crack does. So and it, it mainly affects the left side of the brain, the same area of the brain and the same networks that are associated with obsessive, compulsive, addictive behaviors um, and kids that are naturally left brain dominant. All they want to do is play video games. And if you give it to them, you're just feeding an addict. So, you know, that is probably the number one thing I would tell parents. Be very, very careful and judicious. Studies have shown 
that about between an hour to two hours of all types of screen use, meaning mm-hmm. TV, computer, social media, um, has some cognitive benefit. Um, but anything more than that, the brain crashes. There's like a sharp decline, and, and it actually decreases cognitive activity. Um, and I would say that even that shouldn't be – it should be really limited before the age of six. Um, and, the, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics used to say that and now they caved in themselves. But, you know, parents just need to really be aware. Get your kid outside. Let them climb trees and ride bikes and interact with – the world around them and interact with other people. And that's actually going to make them smarter. That's more likely to get them to an Ivy League school than anything else. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that is such a, an issue I see everywhere. Um, and I think it's an important message to get across. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm really honored to have you here and, and share all your wealth of knowledge. Well, great. There's a couple yeah. things. If I could uh, just mention to people, if they want to know more, obviously they can go to brainbalancecenters.com. They could also go to my website, drrobertmalillo.com. My wife and I actually have a new web series called Disconnected Kids Reconnecting Families, uh, which is going to be coming out um, in mid to end September. So people should look out for that. Uh, And I also just developed um, special vitamins for kids with developmental issues or for all kids with brain development called Kid Genius Vitamins. They're available on Amazon if people want to check them out. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Melillo. I'm so honored to have you on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. If you know someone who would be a great fit for the show, come on over to ingeniousbaby.com and share your tips and story ideas. You are your baby's first and best teacher.